Hello, in this tutorial I'll be taking you through UV mapping and importing animations from Blender 2.7 into Touch Designer. Um, this process is uh, very useful for taking complex animations that you wouldn't be able to uh, do in Touch Designer or that are easier to do in Blender uh, and importing those animations into touch so you can use them in real-time graphics generation. Uh, so recently I've been uh, working a lot with Twitter and pulling information down from Twitter and displaying that in different ways and uh, this is uh, a motion graphic that I'd like to use to do that. Each of these tiles would be a different tweet um, and as you load up a new uh, user, all of those tiles would fall again, and, and you'd have the tweet laid out in each of these. So uh, I've made this, this simple animation to do that, and I'm going to show you how to do a UV map so we can easily uh, pull tweets onto these different tiles and then import uh, all of this over into Touch Designer. So let's get started. Um, up here in your uh, layout uh, selection, you're going to want to go to UV Editor. And in UV Editor, you will see this uh, these two screens pop open. One is your UV Grid, uh, which is the actual editor. And then this is the 3D representation of that grid laid out on, uh, on your geometry. And as you can see, I've already done four of these tiles. I've laid them out um, so that they are uh, to the resolution that I'd want to pull in at, in Touch Designer. Uh, this back surface and this rail are both uh, relatively mapped. I mean, I did it pretty quickly, but uh, it'll, it'll be fine for this tutorial's purposes. Uh, and I'm going to show you how uh, these tiles were all mapped with this last tile here. Uh, which does look a lot different from the rest. And uh, first thing you need to do when you start a UV map is uh, you're going to select the object that you want to map, go into edit mode, and uh, select all of your vertexes by pressing A twice, uh, marking seams, and then unwrapping it. So you're going to press uh, a twice and then mark seams, then U to unwrap. And once you do that, over in this UV editor, you will see all of these vertexes and lines appear. Uh, and these are basically each of the planes on this 3D object. So next what we have to do is find which, which of these planes uh, correspond to what plane on the 3D object. So I like to do this by just wiggling around and trying to find which is which. Uh, you know, the, this, this is the top plane, and this is the most important one to me because I want that's the one that will eventually have the Twitter information on it. These are the sides of this, uh, this tile. So this is, this is the the plane and now now what I want to do is align it to the rest of this grid and what I've been doing so far is creating a 256 by 256 square and bringing it down the side of this and this one will end up going from A1 to B2 so this corner over here to this corner over here um, and and when we pull that into touch designer we should be able to see uh, how that lines up so I'm going to quickly go through and uh, align these, these vertexes to the proper coordinates. And how you do that is you go into this vertex selection, you click on the vertex you want to move, and then uh, you can type in the correct coordinates. So this one would be 0, 0. Uh, this is 256 by 256. No, sorry, not 256. 256 by 0. There we go. Uh, this one is 256 by 256. This UV grid that I have laid out uh, is scaled to 1024 by 1024, and it really just depends on the size of the res resolution you want. 
Uh, so you can import any size into Touch Designer, um, and it will uh, map correctly because really what UV coordinates are are just a normalized value from zero to one. But uh, in in Blender, if you want to previs any of this or if you want to see any of it before you bring it into Touch. Uh, you should try to make this resolution the same size as you would be working with in touch. Cool, so this is now mapped correctly and you can see that all of these um, are in line. So what we're going to do now is go to export and <clears throat> export FBX and then in this uh, export settings menu down here we we just need to make sure that the version of the FBX that we're exporting is FBX 6.1 ASCII uh, that is the kind that touch designer reads in and, and can follow the animation and uh, and knows the the UV coordinates so let's export that and then we can pause this animation or, or uh, get out of blender completely and let's open up a new instance of Touch Designer. It'll take a second on my, my machine. I apologize if my fan turns on. My computer uh, running boot camp, this computer, whenever you start using the GPU at all, it decides that the fan needs to go on full blast. So if the fan ramps up, I, I apologize. Uh, so first thing we need to do is, is go File, Import File, and then find that FBX file that we, we just created. Uh, I saved mine in new folder on my desktop and I called it slide. So we're going to open that up and uh, this is the import manager. Uh, it just basically gives you different settings for like where do you want to save your geometry, where do you want to save your images, where do you want to save your, your animation data and, and the rest of it and whether you want to import cameras or lights. So you can actually create uh, full worlds in uh, Blender with cameras and lights and import all of that information into Touch Designer. So let's create that. Um, and it takes a second, but then it pops up and it's already animating. And this is locked into the timeline. So as this timeline moves, we can see the animation playing through and it loops twice. And then it gets cut off at the end uh, because we loop back through the, uh, the timeline. So the first thing I want to do is, is uh, detach this from the timeline. I, I really want to put that uh, in my own control. So let's dive down into slide and see what's happening in here. The first thing you'll notice is that all of your geometry lives inside that base as other geometry components. So we have each of the, the tiles, uh, the plane, and then that rail. And then you'll also see this chop over here, this null chop, called export nm, and this is all of the uh, animation values that go into making that animation. Uh, so you can see that each of the tiles has a translation, a rotation, and a scale involved, and, and those move uh, as the timeline moves. And then inside takes, the base called takes, we have a default take, which is a file in chop, uh, time slice, which is actually locking it to the timeline, a switch, and an out. And uh, this this time slice is what we want to bypass. Uh, so in order to do that, we're going to create a new chop, a lookup chop, um, attach the default take to the lookup table input of the lookup chop, and then a constant to the index of the lookup chop. Then we want to disconnect the time slice from the switch and connect the lookup chop to the switch. And what this will allow us to do, if we pull all the way back out to uh, view that animation, as I move this constant, we can now scrub through the animation. Uh, all the way to a reset frame, which is one. So from zero to one, is all the way through the animation and then resetting on the last frame. Awesome. This is great, but kind of annoying to control a constant from within a network. So what we really want to do is set this up on a button. 
Uh, so I'm going to create a new component button where uh, it's, it's an on-off toggle. And we want to be able to control the animation from this button. So in order to do that, we need to create a few chops. A lag chop, a math chop, and an alt chop. Uh, the lag chop is what will actually be animating from uh, 0 to 1. So uh, let's give that a longer lag time, about a second. So when we press the button, we are actually going from 0 to 1. All those values are getting pushed. Uh, the math chop is actually going to limit our range from 0 to 0.99 so we can get rid of that last reset frame. And then our null chop is just so we can grab it from uh, within slide. So if we dive back in slide and back inside uh, the base called takes, we can delete that constant. We can uh, create a new chop called select. And then the chop that we're selecting from is that null one uh, outside of slide. So there it is. We should be able to control this animation from a button now. Uh, and yep. Bam, that's awesome. So the next thing I want to do is to be able to control the textures on each of uh, these tiles. Uh, that's the next important thing to me. And uh, we've done that through setting up that UV map. Uh, so each of these are located in a different point of that, that 2D texture. So uh, one way to do this which is probably not the most efficient way, but uh, definitely a way that, that you, can, you can do it, is inside the geometry, you can uh, bring in an operator from each of those. So you can you know, grab your movie file in, whatever it might be, and then throw it into the diffuse map null, and then it'll uh, map itself correctly because all that information lives in uh, either the material or the mesh. Uh, but that might not be the most efficient way to do that because you have to do that for all of your elements. Uh, so a, a better way to do that would be to create a select uh, in each of, your, each of your geometry elements. So I'm going to do that real quick. Select. Um, be careful about cloning here. I've run into it twice now where I clone, even if the geometry is the same, the UV map is not. So if you clone through all of these, you're going to run into a problem where you're selecting the same UV map as your clone, which is uh, not what we're looking for. Uh, so I've yet to find a good workaround for that, but I'll keep working on it and, and post one when I find it. Uh, so movie file in uh, on the outside of your network and find a good image to, to do that. Create a new null top, which all the selects will reference from. And then uh, we're going to split our screen, dive into slide again. And then each of these selects will get the, uh, the, the null top. And there you have it. Uh, each of them are selecting from this null. And you can see that our UV map is actually working. The, the Z is all lined up, the X is lined up, and the, the last element there. Uh, so we can go ahead and animate through that, and all of that stays where it should be. Radical. Uh, so how do you how do you align text to that? Like how can you create uh, different images that that can align in here in the, in the right way? Well, you need to know that UV map. So I've already done a bit of this, uh, and I created this talks file 
which uh, is aligned to the UV map, right? So each of these, there's text, and that text goes into a, a text top, and that text top goes into a composite, and it's transformed to be where uh, that UV map is. So this guy is, has a resolution of 256 by 256, and then he's placed to line up in the bottom corner where that uh, that UV map starts. So if we take this out to that null, we should see all of this text aligned in its right spot. And there you have it. All the text is aligned and put onto the correct UV coordinates and the correct tiles. Uh, this is really powerful, and here's why. Uh, because you have everything coming out as a single image, um, what this means is if you have another image, uh, a different uh, composite chain, a different image that you're working with, you can do texture instancing. So if I create another null top uh, with a different image in it, and I want to create multiples of these. Uh, so let's say, you know, show an entire Twitter history of somebody, right? Um, what you can do is make a SOP line, uh, a SOP to DAP, and use this to do instancing. Oh, not copy into. Let's get rid of that. Not going to really affect anything, but it's a messy network. Um, instance, turn instancing on, plop that guy in as the parameter instance, and then tx is equal to p0. And then if we add in our render network, the rest of our render network, And then set our camera to the thing. I'm looking at our geometry. Pop that up a little higher. There we have it. Uh, we can actually see that, um, well, our, we, we need to space out this line a little bit more. Uh, but we now have those two elements side by side, and uh, we can do a texture instance on these guys. So if we adjust our light, uh, this is actually kind of bad. If we adjust our light so we can see everything a bit better, um, we can go through and in slide in instance two, the instance two tab, our texture instance we're gonna set to index, or our texture index we're gonna set to index, and our instance textures we're gonna set to null bracket two slash three. And that'll give us those two textures that we set up, null two and null three, as uh, the instance textures here. So this whole object is textured to uh, a single UV, um, which gives us, that, that's a very powerful thing because instancing is, is uh, it's not very intensive, right? Like you can have multiple, multiple instances and, and your CPU won't care. Your GPU just adds on another copy of it, uh, but your CPU doesn't have to calculate it at all, which is really awesome. Uh, and the, the animation still works through instancing. Um, so this is about the end of, of the tutorial though. From here you can, you can figure out really awesome ways of, of using this workflow to create uh, exciting visuals for lots of different real-time graphics and, and what have you, and, and doing it all in Blender, which provides some some better tools for uh, sculpting and, and uh, animation. So I hope you enjoyed the tutorial. Uh, thank you for watching. Bye.